supported by Ancient Egypt magazine. It's a story that spans almost 4,000 years. A story mired in controversy. Its message is timeless and mysterious. The Egyptian Book of the Dead is the ancient Egyptian's guide to the afterlife, and it may well be the world's first religious document. From the maverick archaeologist who plotted to smuggle it out of Egypt... I will not tolerate any deviation from the law, either by you or by your native friends. ...to a terrifying journey into the afterlife itself. The Egyptian Book of the Dead is a story as old as civilization, the first vision of Judgment Day. A book that may answer the questions mankind has been asking for millennia. Mummies. The mysterious remnants of one of history's oldest civilizations. They whisper of vast expanses of time, of secrets wrapped deep within their ancient shrouds. They are so familiar, yet so alien. A frightening reminder of our own mortality, yet a tantalizing promise of immortality. The mummy is only the remnant of a far greater mystery. The ancient Egyptians believed in a vast and intricate afterlife. Each mummified corpse was expected to resurrect in another world, for which there was only one guide, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The name given to scrolls entombed with a mummified dead in ancient Egypt. The Book of the Dead was a kind of guidebook for the deceased and a book of spells and aid to aid the deceased in his journey through the afterlife and the process of becoming immortal. It was certainly a book of magic. It's a collection of spells, the chief purpose of which is to enable life after death and immortality to the deceased. It is a book for the dead because it tells us about what the dead will face in the afterlife. This is why we call it the Book of the Dead. It is very important because this is a quest of immortality. It has been said that the ancient Egyptians cared more about their life after death than their life on Earth. The ancient city of Thebes in the 19th dynasty, more than 3,000 years ago. This is the story of one Egyptian whom history only records as Ani. Ani lived during a high point of Egyptian culture known as the New Kingdom. Between 1600 and 1200 BC, brilliant military pharaohs conquered lands from Nubia to Syria. Pharaohs like Ramses and Seti built enormous palaces and lavish religious temples. Ani enjoyed one of the highest standards of living in ancient Egyptian history. It was in these historic periods of relative prosperity that people began to contemplate questions of philosophy life and the afterlife. The afterlife weighed heavily on Annie's mind. The idea of dying without proper preparation for the next world jeopardized one's chances for eternal paradise.
The evidence of Annie's obsession with the afterlife is this extraordinary piece of funeral art known as the Scroll of Annie. The Scroll of Annie is rightly one of the most famous copies of the Book of the Dead because of the high quality of the artistry, the writing, and especially the beautifully painted vignettes are really among the most impressive of any of the Books of the Dead that have survived. Archaeologists have uncovered more than 25,000 copies of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the oldest text dating from 1500 BC, the latest from the 4th century AD. But it is here, at the British Museum, in the heart of 21st century London, that the famous Scroll of Ani, the finest example of the Egyptian Book of the Dead ever preserved, can be seen. Painted in approximately 1250 BC, it contains 65 prayers and magical spells and over 150 colorful illustrations. This exquisite piece of work is one of the longest scrolls ever discovered. When unrolled, it measures an incredible 78 feet. But the way in which the museum acquired this masterpiece is steeped in controversy. The scroll was brought from Egypt in 1887 by a museum curator, Dr. Ernest Alfred Thompson Wallace Budge. He was a prolific author writing over a hundred books on Egyptology, most of which are still in print. He published some of the first translations of important Egyptian text. He collected thousands of artifacts acknowledged as some of the finest examples of ancient art. Yet there are those who say Budge was a second-rate scholar, a poor archaeologist, and a cultural thief, acquiring antiquities by any means possible. He was out there, well, basically looting and pillaging and buying up what he could. People apply cultural judgments which are totally out of time. Uh, the fact that he took materials out of ancient cultures for its day was quite normal. You can't look at him from a modern point of view. You know, this is a, uh, he's a cultural thief. This, this is not the way they looked at it in those days. But on the other hand, he did sail very close to the wind. I think he was a thief. Because, you know, you can be an honest man all your life, but if you steal something, you become a thief. Although Budge may be controversial today, in his lifetime, he was a respected translator and one of the finest curators at the British Museum. In the autumn of 1887, the museum sent him to Egypt on an artifact collecting expedition. Budge's trip to Egypt was perfectly timed. Shortly after his arrival, news of newly discovered artifacts began to surface, which he noted in his autobiography. Before I'd been in Cairo many hours, I found that everyone was talking about the discoveries made in Upper Egypt, and the most extraordinary stories were afloat. Rumors of the finds have reached all the great cities of Europe and there were representatives of several continental museums in Cairo, each doing his best to secure the lion's share. Budge's first stop was the Egyptian Museum to meet a fellow Egyptologist. There he was shocked by the shabby state of the museum's collection. This scarab was supposed to give its owner immortality. In this place, it's lucky if the scarab itself lasts six months. Egypt doesn't have the resources that the great European museums have, Mr. Budge. But you think at least you could dust the place? You think at least they could keep the treasure from water damage? Well, hopefully the new director will help change that. Ah, the famous Monsieur Grebeau. 
overseeing the recovery and preservation of all Egyptian artifacts was the new head of colonial antiquities, a Frenchman named Eugène Grebeau. Monsieur Grebeau would argue that the British Museum is just another thief smuggling away Egypt's heritage. Sounds just like a Frenchman. Treasure in Luxor? That doesn't sound like archaeology to me. Emile, I'd like you to meet my assistant, Ramshi. Madame. You're not planning on doing anything illegal, are you? Of course not. Purchasing antiquities is a theft. It's not a theft. As long as Egypt treats its treasures like this, it's preservation. Good day, Emile. Budge was determined to see these new discoveries for himself and set about planning his trip. Luxor was 450 miles along the Nile from his base in Cairo. Budge knew he had to reach Luxor before other collectors. His competitive instinct served him well, for among the artifacts was a window to another world one that modern man had never seen. The discovery of the scroll of Ani is one of Egyptology's greatest stories. An adventure involving conspiracy, intrigue, and a controversial hero. Ernest A. Wallace Budge. In 1887, Budge was in Egypt to acquire artifacts for the British Museum. I received information from a native in Egypt that some very important discoveries in Thebes had been made. He told me that a tomb had been found on the western bank of the Nile, which was the best he'd ever seen and that there were in it several rolls of papyrus. He urged me to come without delay and to take possession of all these things before the authorities could seize them and cast their owners into prison. The late 19th century was a really dynamic time in the history of Egyptology. On the one hand, you had the emergence of modern archaeology, but at the same time, you had the old, long-standing tradition of looting, uh, of even mining sites by antiquities dealers. Budge rarely excavated antiquities from tombs. He preferred to buy them from dealers. This thriving black market led to an extraordinary collection for the British Museum but it also helped destroy some of Egypt's archaeological treasures. In the black market for selling antiquities was very bad. Egypt was raped. We call it the rape of the Nile. They raped the Nile. They took this heritage out of the country. And it's now everywhere. Budge's assistant, Ramsey, took him to a black market antiquities dealer where he was given an intriguing artifact found in Luxor. He protecteth the weak against the strong, and he heareth the cry of him that is bound in fetters. In 1887, Budge was one of the few Westerners who could read hieroglyphics. It is real, yes? Yes, I'd say it's very real. It's a description of the sun god Ra, its 18th dynasty. I'd venture to say that this is from a copy of the Book of the Dead. I call it the Bible of the Egyptians. It's the oldest religious text in the world. Surely not older than the Bible. Indeed it is. In fact, this piece seems to be from the so-called negative confessions. This was a list of sins one should not commit. The real source of the Ten Commandments. Mahmoud. Uh, yes. Is this the only piece of papyrus? Oh, no. The man who found it, the man who found the scroll, he cut it into small pieces to sell it to collectors. I have no more. But this is from the new discovery. Yes. I have someone bring you to the man who found it. He is in Luxor. The problem with black market antiquities is that people wind up stealing things and taking them out of their context. Whether it was done in the 1800s or today, it is equally bad. By doing this, you completely destroy any understanding one has of the object. It's a pleasure, as always, Mahmoud. You still prefer British pounds, I take it? 
Of course, Mr. Budge. I'll have a guide waiting for you tomorrow morning. It is a two days ride. We'll be ready. Budge knew he had to hurry. He was well aware that the new director of antiquities at the Cairo Museum, Eugene Grebeau, was trying to get there first. Back in 1887, the rumored find of papyrus scrolls was important. But the true historic value of the Book of the Dead is only now being understood. Many believe it is the oldest example of religious writing in the world. You can see things are written in the Bible, in the Old Testament and Quran. And therefore, religion today doesn't come suddenly. There is stages. The Book of the Dead is really the first stage of the human thinking about the afterlife. Book of the Dead has its earliest antecedents in the oldest religious text we have from ancient Egypt, the Pyramid Text. And these were inscribed on pyramids during the 5th dynasty, around 2300 BC. Later, royal and noble Egyptians are choosing to have those same pyramid inscriptions written inside their coffins. And that set of texts are known as the Coffin Texts. Then, by the time of the New Kingdom, which was a tremendous research in uh, literary and artistic production, we find mortuary literature that begins to gather all the spells from the coffins and write them into a papyrus roll that can be buried with your mummy. In 1250 BC, during Ani's lifetime, the spells in the Book of the Dead were already over a thousand years old. We know from the historical record that Ani was a temple scribe. Today, he might be considered an accountant. We find out that he is a royal scribe. He is in charge of tallying the accounts of all of the offerings made to the gods. Temples were both religious institutions, but also major economic ones. And he was in charge of uh, offerings, but also of granaries of the temple. Ani's position as scribe tells us he was part of an educated group within the Egyptian elite. He would have been very concerned about his place in the afterlife. Eternity could only be guaranteed by owning a Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead was probably created in an institution called the House of Life, which was a place connected with great temple complexes where religious learning was promoted. This is where new rituals were designed, myths were created or at least elaborated on, and funeral texts were generated. Ani would have met with the priest at one of the temples to inquire about the Book of the Dead. There were two ways of getting a Book of the Dead. One was you commissioned one especially, uh, and, and therefore probably paid a premium price to have a very high quality one that was designed for, y for you precisely from the very outset. We also know that quite a lot of books of the dead were made without indicating who they belonged to. The name of the owner, which is repeated throughout any book of the dead, is actually left blank so that when somebody came along and said they wanted one, they would simply write in... <laughs> in his or her tomb. Temple complexes in the New Kingdom were both places of worship and business. An Egyptian scroll began life as a stalk of the papyrus plant, which grew plentifully along the Nile. The stem's outer rinds were removed, then laid in strips 
and pound it together into thin sheets. In a dry climate like Egypt's, papyrus was extremely stable, lasting for thousands of years without any deterioration. The next step in constructing a Book of the Dead was the writing of the spells. The scribal profession was one of the most esteemed in the ancient world. They controlled knowledge, and knowledge is power. Now, the scribe didn't get to be a scribe by accident. It took years of rigorous training, starting with small boys who were sent to scribal schools at the temples or in the royal palace. They spent years and years mastering the thousands of symbols in the hieroglyphic language. In ancient Egypt, language is itself magical. It has the power to create. It is very much like the idea in the Gospel of John, that in the beginning is the word, that there is this primal principle of language, which is certainly part of the Book of the Dead's whole point. It aims to create a blessed afterlife. The final point in creating the Book of the Dead would be painting the individual pictures or vignettes. Ancient Egyptians believed that these images had a magical power, enough to determine a man's destiny. It's all part of this manufacturing uh, process. You can see this sort of mass uh, production mode of uh, really confecting, assembling a Book of the Dead uh, according to, to order. Purchasing a Book of the Dead would have affected Annie's entire family. It was quite expensive. Perhaps a half a year's wage for a person of, let's say, Annie's status. The ancient records reveal that Annie's wife was named Tutu. The couple would have had many discussions regarding the Book of the Dead. The choice was a difficult one for a family in the New Kingdom. To provide for the present or eternity. Annie's quest to acquire a book of the dead did in fact bring him immortality but not until the intervention of Wallace Budge 3,000 years later. I assure you, I make a very unpleasant enemy. Ancient Egyptian civilization was a culture of death. Very little is left of ancient Egyptian daily life, but we know a great deal about them because of the lavish attention they devoted to their tombs, their treasures, their scrolls, and even their mummified corpses. Today, the religion of the pharaohs is meeting the technology of the 21st century. In an unprecedented study, Egyptologists are applying cutting-edge medical science to 3,000-year-old mummies. The digital technology allows Egyptologists to virtually unwrap mummies without doing any harm. Oh, oh, I see. We even have the... Uh, yeah. Beard. Beneath the wrappings, a 2,000-year-old amulet protects the deceased from the dangers of the afterlife. And this is from 600 BC, 20, now, when they were wrapping the body, they would also put amulets, protective amulets, all around the body, both in the front and also in the back. That would help the body achieve an afterlife. And what's quite nice is that some of these amulets are tied into things in the Book of the Dead. So you know that they are there to protect the body against specific perils that they're going to meet on the way through to the other side of the afterlife. Let's see, the mask was on. Uh... But why did the ancient Egyptians go to the trouble of preserving their dead to begin with? 
the ancient Egyptians mummified their dead because they believed that the soul really needed a more physical vehicle to enjoy all of the sort of physical delights of the um, afterlife. And so they used to mummify bodies, which meant preserving them so that they could be used by the soul to go back into the body, which would be perfectly preserved, and then could enjoy, you know, food, drink, anything else um, that the afterlife had to offer. But mummifying a body was not an easy process. What the embalmers would do was remove all the internal organs, um, the lungs, the liver, the stomach and the intestines. The organs were placed in ceremonial jars, known as canopic jars, which would later be entombed with the body. Next, a long hook was used to pull the brain out through the nose. Ancient Egyptians did not believe the brain was an essential organ, so could be dispensed with. You can actually see the defect is right here, where they go in through the nose, punched a hole in the floor of the skull to remove the brain. Once the brain had been removed, they would melt resins and pour the liquid resin through the nostril. and um, sort of roll the head around so that the cranium was coated. This was done so that they could prevent bacterial growth in the cranium. The heart was the only organ that would stay within the body. It was thought to be the center of intelligence and feeling, and those would be needed in the afterlife. They would wash the body out, dry it using natron, which is a kind of a salt and baking soda kind of mixture. And after 40 days of desiccation had elapsed, they would put oil and unguents on the body and then wrap it with great um, ceremony rituals. And that would be the end of mummification and it would be buried. Mummification was just the beginning of a long journey. A journey for the soul of the deceased and the Egyptian Book of the Dead was the only guide to a life beyond the grave. Around the year 1250 BC, an Egyptian scribe named Ani began thinking seriously about the afterlife. He believed the Book of the Dead would offer him peace of mind. When you die and you are getting to the afterlife, um, the way, the journey in between is very perilous and the deceased spirit, before they were reborn forever, had to go through a series of tests. And the Book of the Dead provides answers and protection against the perils of the journey. This is a quest of immortality. Without knowing what is in the Book of the Dead, the deceased will never go to the afterlife. The most important thing for the ancient Egyptian in the afterlife. The Book of the Dead was a costly proposition and the decision to purchase one, a difficult and complicated process. With 186 spells to choose from, a scroll would be produced based on a person's needs and budget. The priests of the temples helped a person choose which spells would be needed in the afterlife. I sometimes wonder if these Book of the Dead didn't start out in some ways as a little extra moonlighting for money. Once you convince all the rich people that they just have to have this thing, then, I mean, the sky is the limit in how much you could charge. The creation of one's very own Book of the Dead may also have been a status symbol. Now, the Book of the Dead would have been quite expensive for any ordinary person to afford. And in fact, we can see this play out archaeologically. We find that the Book of the Dead is only possessed by members of the elite. This was very different from the earliest days of Egyptian culture. Originally, mummification and an afterlife among the gods was reserved for the pharaoh only. 
Yet by Annie's time, the middle classes, and even the poor, hoped for a life after death and were willing to pay for it. It shows the democratization of the afterlife, because originally those texts were only for the king. Then, when we get to the Middle Kingdom, uh, they become accessible to sort of the high nobility. And then we get to the New Kingdom, all of a sudden a much larger group gets access to these texts. But in the New Kingdom, the Book of the Dead was written for everyone. It was found in the private tombs. It was found in the nobles' tombs. It was found in the tombs of the artisans. The spread of belief in the afterlife affected more than just the newly emerging middle class. Some scholars say the Book of the Dead influenced Jewish and Christian scripture. Ancient Christianity owes a great deal to ancient Egypt for its concept of heaven. This makes sense because most of the early Christian fathers were native Egyptians. And so when documents were being written concerning the nature and substance of the afterlife, since these things were not originally written in the Bible, the ancient Egyptians sort of filled in the blanks. The idea of spending one's afterlife with your loved ones in a pleasant place where you could do what you like is the same in both Christianity and in ancient Egyptian religion. There's even a case to be made that the Egyptian Book of the Dead influenced New Testament and Christian religious imagery. It's very clear when we study the history of the New Testament that, in fact, their main competition for the religion of Jesus was the religion of Isis and Osiris and their child, Horus. Many of the early figurations of the Virgin Mary sitting with baby Jesus on her lap are actually based on Isis statues where Isis is holding Pharaoh, now her symbolic son. One of the first people to notice the connection between the Book of the Dead and the Bible was Wallace Budge. The fact remains the Egyptians did believe in one God. Osiris, who had lived upon the earth, had suffered a cruel death and had risen from the dead. There is no doubt that certain views and religious ideas of Christian sects may be traced directly to the Egyptians. It's interesting to see how people's ethical beliefs and religious beliefs, no matter where they are from or what century they were sort of written in, all have a great deal in common. When Wallace Budge arrived in Egypt in 1887, the country was controlled by a European coalition. Following a nationalist rebellion in 1882, Great Britain and France shared control of the country and the vital Suez Canal. Their coalition would control the politics and economy of Egypt for decades. But it was an uncomfortable union, and men like Budge didn't make the alliance any easier. Budge had heard rumors of an enormous discovery in Luxor, and his plans to find it were about to put him on a collision course with the new policies of the French head of colonial antiquities, Eugene Grebo. Mr. Budge. Yes? You will come with me. I will. What's this about? It is Monsieur Grebo. He must see you. He must, must he? Ramsey, I'll see you in front of the hotel tomorrow morning at nine. Monsieur Grebo. By nature and disposition and training, he was unsuited for the post in which he was thrust. Sit. You are to wait here. Here. And all those who had at heart the welfare of Egypt regretted the appointment. A pardon the subterfuge, Mr. Budge. 
I thought it might be unseemly for the director of the Egyptian Museum to be seen in public with a man of your reputation. Monsieur Graybo, I presume. My reputation and that of my museum are among my most cherished honors. Will you join me for tea? I'm afraid you will have to return to the British Museum empty-handed, Mr. Budge. As the keeper of Egypt's antiquities, I must inform you it is my intention to prevent any looting of the nation's treasures. Monsieur Graybeau, the goal of the British Museum is the preservation of the world's heritage. <laughs> my predecessor tells me that on your last trip, you left Egypt with over 1,400 illegal antiquities. Your predecessor sent nearly the same amount back to the Louvre. It is illegal to remove antiquities from the country, Mr. Abadj. I intend to enforce the law strictly. Anyone suspected of illegal antiquity trading will face painful scrutiny, perhaps even torture. Threatening the men and women who live here is not the way to gain their trust. I do not need their trust. I need their obedience. All antiquities belong to the state and to the state's museums. But these people have made their living from antiquities for generations. Rather than fight them, you should make an alliance with them. They will lead you to even greater fines. The law is quite clear. All antiquities, whether discovered or not, fall under my jurisdiction. I will not tolerate any deviation from the law, either by you or by your native friends. Well... I'm sorry we don't see eye to eye. Do not oppose me, Mr. Budge. I assure you, I make a very unpleasant enemy. I don't see you as an enemy. Just unpleasant. Good day to you. Budge knew the French authorities would arrest him if they discovered him buying antiquities. He had to get to Luxo as quickly as possible to see for himself the enormous hoard. This thing's supposed to take me all the way to Luxor, is it? Wallace Budge was willing to risk arrest, jail, and even worse, to get the treasure. If an ancient Egyptian wanted to guarantee himself eternal life, there was only one answer. The Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead varied from individual to individual. We have up to 189 chapters that could be in the Book of the Dead. In fact, that's almost never the case, that we have all 189. So we find that the scribes, based on their own theology or the preferences of their customers, had a lot of leeway in how they would put the Book of the Dead together. Now, a spell is a magical utterance or incantation, and the purpose of these was to help the deceased achieve eternal life or immortality, life after death. The spells included in the Book of the Dead contained uh, protections from demons that might attack the deceased. There's even a spell to protect the deceased from dying a second time. Egyptians faced hard physical labor in the afterlife as they plowed the soil and tilled the fields of the gods. <laughs> Chapter 6 allows the deceased, whenever called upon, to perform any manual labor. Uh, the deceased brings to life little clones of him or herself, and they do all the dirty work. So everybody had to take Chapter 6 with them, because otherwise you'd be there in the underworld without your maid. The Egyptians even raided some of the spells. Some of them were annotated, truly excellent, good a million times. 
Now, how a dead person could report back on them, I don't know. The Egyptians believed that the heart was the most important organ that one possessed, and that was where one's soul lived, that was where one's essence was, where you thought, believed, everything came from there. And thus, they left the heart inside the body because they felt that your heart was necessary as part of the process of getting to the afterlife. Such an important organ needed extra protection. That protection came in the form of the heart scarab. The heart scarab is a representation of a scarab beetle. The reason why it's a beetle is that the rising sun in Egypt was symbolized by a, a beetle, a winged beetle rising up above the horizon. So the scarab beetle was associated with the idea of the rising sun. The rising sun was a symbol for the rebirth of dead Egyptians. The scarab would be inscribed on the back with one of the spells that you see in the Book of the Dead, which basically explains why I did not lie, I did not steal, I did not cheat, and my heart is good, it is justified. The heart scarab is a bit like a crib sheet for the deceased. They were very concerned that their heart might reveal certain things that they had done while they were living that could be injurious to their chances in the afterlife. Just as important as the text in the Book of the Dead were the lavish illustrations. The illustrations in the Book of the Dead give a little extra oomph to existing spells. For example, the spell against the demon beetle that might eat you up had a big depiction of the demon beetle on it being fended off by someone. So this would magically help enact the spell and help the deceased fend off this nasty critter that was about to eat him. Annie's scroll may have taken months, perhaps more than a year, to put together. To an ancient Egyptian, it was well worth the time and effort, for it was meant to last for eternity. One can only imagine the relief and joy Annie must have felt when his scroll was finally complete. There are many scrolls from ancient Egypt, but few have the elaborateness and artistic splendor as the scroll of Ani. James Wasserman is a graphics artist and publisher. When I saw this scroll, my breath was taken away. It was just unbelievable. You know, the color, the richness, the mystery of the images, the power that was obviously in there was, was phenomenal. At, at the same time, I was studying the text, trying to learn what the heck the book was supposed to be. Wasserman produced a book from Annie's scroll, which not only includes the entire 78-foot parchment, but also its English translation. It is now possible to read Annie's Book of the Dead as Ani himself would have read it. If one reads and studies and meditates upon the images and the stories that are in the Book of the Dead, one sees a sense of pride, a sense of belonging. The initiate is seeking to learn and to persevere through tests of his moral character. Here we see Ani and Tutu approaching the most dramatic scene of the entire papyrus, where Ani's heart will be placed on a scale and balanced against the feather of truth of the goddess Mott. If his heart is found too heavy, he will immediately be devoured by this monster, Amit. For the ancient Egyptians, Death was the first step towards salvation. When Ani's wife died, the scroll may not have been placed in her tomb, but it would guide her. A single scroll meant to unite a couple in the field of reeds. <laughs> Shek 
شهوب نون راس شوی تو وات وانفی رینخی خن یا پدیس فوت نیتی Three thousand years after Annie lived, Ernest Wallace Budge was on a mission. He'd been told of a rumored treasure recently discovered in Luxor, the modern name for the ancient city of Thebes. And he intended to be the first one to the ancient trove. Thank you, gentlemen. There will be bigger batches on my return. But his quest was about to be interrupted. Stop. Mr. Budge? You again? What is it this time? You are under arrest. Here. Under the orders of Eugene Grebeau, the new and zealous guardian of Egyptian antiquities, who was also on his way to Luxor. Stay here till I return back. Budge's assistant, Ramsey, had learned that Grebeau was leaving for Luxor that very morning and had told the captain of Grebo's barge that if he ran it ashore, Budge would give him 50 British pounds. And so I will. A fine piece of work, Ramsey, my boy. Budge already had a reputation for deception. His questionable methods of acquisition are still being debated today. One problem with Budge is that he wasn't an archaeologist. He cut corners and bended rules at a time when you could pretty much buy anything you wanted. And so he was also thought of as being perhaps a little less than ethical in terms of his collecting methods. I get the impression that Budge, with some of his wheeling and dealing, was much more on the Indiana Jones side than on the side of the, the little old scholar, you know, who just wants to sit in the back room of the British Museum. But others suggest that Budge's approach to collecting was common at the time. When one considers the number of antiquities that were lost, destroyed, stolen, one can only thank somebody who is a bit of a scoundrel like Budge for having the wherewithal to go in and kind of bribe officials and engage in these bizarre little subterfuges because he preserved these things. Then he used his, uh, his influence and he used his scholarship at that time he used his presence and his friendship to the foreign Egyptologists in Egypt to steal many antiquities and take it out of the country and put it at the British Museum. That was not fair. At last, Budge set off for Luxor, still one step ahead of his nemesis. The treasure he sought was said to include rare pieces of an Egyptian Book of the Dead. When I arrived in Luxor, I found that the dealers had indeed collected many valuable things from the tombs at Western this is, Thebes. No, no, no. This is uh, antiquity. Antic? Okay. The natives treated the government's claim to all antiquities in Egypt with contempt. Hmm. Antiquities were plentiful. Camp. Asher bound to that. Dakate. Five pounds. But money was not. Oh. Shut up. Oh. Budge could only imagine what these ruins would have looked like in the time of the pharaohs. Some 3,000 years earlier, when Luxor was known as Thebes, a scribe named Ani commissioned his own Book of the Dead at a cost of half a year's salary. Its value to him in the afterlife would soon be tested. We do not know how Annie died, but we have a good idea of how he was buried. As a royal scribe, Annie was a member of the elite his entombment would have been elaborate and expensive. We know there were different, shall we say, price ranges for mummification. Poor people would choose a mummification form that was really very low rent. The poor person would be taken by his or her family 
and buried in the sand outside somebody else's tomb or pyramid. And the hope there was that the poor person could sort of follow along. There was kind of a trickle down. If you got the high-end funeral, your mummification could take up to 272 days. You got all the best coffins and sarcophagi. After mummification, the deceased was placed on a boat-shaped sledge pulled by oxen and taken to his tomb in one of the large cemeteries that dotted the western shore of the Nile. Illustrations of Egyptian funerals show not only grieving relatives, but also musicians, dancers, priests, and professional mourners. <laughs>